Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Priscilla. I am the instructor for this afternoon's class, working with basic stitch properties and connectors. I thank you for all, all of you for attending today's class. Um, during class, all attendees are muted and will remain muted till the end of the class. Once I cover the information, I will unmute all of you for a brief question and answer session. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And again, today this class is working basic stitch properties and connectors. What we're going to talk about in today's class is are the basic stitch types. All embroidery is comprised of three stitches, a running stitch, a satin stitch, and a fill stitch. Anything over and above that is a variation of one of those three stitch types. A fill stitch in our software is referred to as a tatami stitch. We're also going to go through the object properties of the various um, stitch types. We're going to talk about how to control the density, pull compensation, what it is, how we turn it on, what it helps with. We'll speak about underlay. And we're going to talk about connectors. Connectors in the Wilcom software is what generates our trims between our embroidered objects or within our lettering objects. I'm going to go ahead and just bring up my embroidery studio. One of the first topics that I want to speak about are basic stitch types in embroidery. Um, as you know, there's uh, different stitches, some that are decorative, some that are you know, traditional, your satins, your fills, and your run stitches. But what's important to know is the basic stitch types in embroidery are a run stitch. And I'm just going to create one on the screen. A satin stitch. Let me just make it a little bit thinner. And then a fill stitch, or what we refer to as a tatami stitch in our software. So the first one is a running, a running stitch. We then have a satin stitch, and we have a fill stitch. Let's just go ahead, and I'm going to take my design out of true view. And I'm going to turn on my needle penetration. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in my running stitch. If you look at the screen, a running stitch is, what is just that. It's a stitch that runs along a designated path, one that we, as digitizers, create via the input method. And as you know, with the Wilcom software, a straight point the line is always created with the left mouse button, and anything that's curved is the right mouse button. The straight lines, straight edges, created with left, curved, with the right stitch. So this is a running stitch. So this is just a simple running stitch. It just it creates a stitch between each of the needle penetrations, and it's just one layer of stitches, or one ply of stitches. There are different variations to the run stitch, and those are found in our outline toolbox. So we do have a run, which is a single run. We have a triple run. Based on the various elements that you may have, you might have motif run, back stitch, and stem stitch. Down here, we have a satin stitch, and the satin stitch are just stitches that go back and forth, either left to right, up and down, along a designated defined object. 
Traditionally, satin stitches are used for smaller areas. Notice how my crosshair is going back and forth. Um, satin stitches you see with a lot of text that's embroidered. Run stitch is used a lot of times for bordering, for traveling between objects. Some devices may just use the running stitch to create their own underlay. I'm going to go ahead and I think change this to a red. It might be a little bit easier to see. One sec. Yeah. Cut and go. I do apologize. It's a little bit easier to get to red. The third object here, we generate it with tatami. Now, if I really zoom in into this stitch, you see, in essence, what a tatami stitch is, is various run stitches generated close to one another to create that fill effect. But you see, you see where the crosshair is moving, the needle down, so it almost looks like a running stitch, like extremely close to the previous running stitch to create the spill pattern. At the top of the screen, here is our satin icon, and this is our tatami icon. I could click on the tatami here, and then select the satin stitch to change its stitch type. And now, as we move on throughout the class, we are going to talk about that split we see down the middle of our object. Let's talk about the object properties. The object properties are properties associated with the object on the screen that control the manner in which that particular object is going to sew. So with my running stitch selected on the screen, I'm going to come over here to my object properties, and the software automatically goes to the properties for the run stitch. So a run stitch has three properties associated with it. It has the length of the run stitch and then the variable run length. The length is the length between needle penetrations. I'm hoping everybody can see that. So right where my pointer is, this white dot is a needle penetration, and then the other needle penetration. So this is what creates our running stitch. If I go ahead and I select this, go into my properties, and I'm going to go ahead and reduce this to 1.0, and then I'll press Enter, you'll see that those needle penetrations have come closer together. So now that run stitch is going to be tighter because of the needle penetration. Because it's closer, it's also going to increase my stitch count. I'm going to go ahead and undo that. Down at the bottom left-hand corner of my screen is the current stitch count. It's at 2,327. If I come back into the properties for my run stitch and I change it to 1.0, my needle penetration is not only come closer together, but my stitch count goes up. I can also increase that so there would be about three millimeters per needle penetration. I say about because the Wilcom software has a variable run length. What the variable run length does is when we create a running stitch around an extremely tight corner, if that object is small, it may not be able to create a run that's three millimeters to turn the corner. So it variates the run length to make that, to make that turn. Let me go ahead and see if I can create a 
And if we look at that, if we look at the shape that I just digitized here, it runs right along the line that I created. If we zoom in on it, we can actually in this area where the curve is not as tight, a longer running stitch than in this tight curve. That's because of the variable run length. The minimum length is will not make a stitch smaller than eight tenths of a millimeter. I'm going to go ahead and turn this off while the object is selected so that you can see what's happened to my shape. It's not as clear or not as the curve is not as um, what's the word I'm trying to look it's not as tight as when it was um, generated with the variable run length. My recommendation is to always keep that on. There might be cases where you need to to set um, to turn off the variable run length and then what happens is every stitch is generated at two and a half millimeters in this case or whatever value you've entered as the user. I'm going to delete, I'm going to delete my um, running stitch and we're going to talk about the satin stitch here that we have here. And the satin stitch could create it in any shape. It's also used the default stitch type for text. So this is a satin stitch and this is a satin stitch. Let's just talk about um, the satin stitch. This is a stitch stitches back and forth, either left to right, up and down, um, changes stitch angles as we turn curves. It's used to fill in small areas for detailing and large design. And um, for the majority of text that we see in logos, with the exception of large, maybe jacket back designs where a text is very large, then you may see text done with a tatami stitch. So by selecting this object and coming over to the object properties for so the satin, you see that this particular stitch type now has more properties associated with, with it than the run stitch. So one of the topics that we were going to talk about was controlling the density. The density is how dense or how many stitches are going to be generated in an object to cover it with either a satin stitch or a fill stitch. Any time that you generate an object in the Wilcom software with a satin stitch, it defaults to auto spacing. The auto spacing defaults to 90%. And what the auto spacing does is it generates the distance between the needle penetrations is the distance between the needle penetration creating the satin stitch. If we take a look at this object where it is narrow on the, on the left side of the object and much wider, just by looking at this you can tell that the needle penetrations are further apart in the narrow area and much tighter in the wide area. That is controlled. I'm just going to move this over. That is controlled by the auto setting, the Wilcom auto spacing. If we click on settings, what we see here is the stitch in millimeters, so the length of our stitch, and then what the spacing would be between needle penetration. I highly advise not touching this, um, but I just wanted to explain to you that if the length of the stitch is, say, half a millimeter, it opens it up by five tenths of a millimeter. And notice if it's eight millimeters long, it's much tighter. Again, because the wider the object or the larger an object, more stitches that are needed 
to cover. I'll come back to how to adjust this in just a couple of minutes. Let's move down the line in the properties of the satin stitch. The next one down is the satin count. If I take a look at the object, and I go to the beginning of the design, and I start moving through it, notice the needle penetration is just back and forth. It's just one layer of thread. What the satin count does is it's multiple layers of that same stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and set it to three. It's regenerated my object. I'm going to go to the beginning of the object, and I'm going to use my arrow key, my right arrow key, to move forward through the design. If you look closely, I'm going to try to really zoom in on this area. Watch my white crosshair. It's going along the same stitch three times. This is used, this has been used in the past to possibly create or to simulate hand stitch embroidery. On traditional embroidery, I haven't seen it too much, but it has come up um, for different users on what that is, so I wanted to bring it to your attention since that is the satin count. I'm going to go ahead and set it back at one and press enter. And come up to satin and scroll. The auto split on our software defaults. The defaults to on. The auto split creates this valley that we see in the satin stitch. When is this generated? It's generated when the software detects a satin a stitch length of greater than seven millimeters. So what it's going to do, and I can, we can see the additional needle penetration within this object when it detects the stitch length longer than 7 millimeters. You're probably asking why that is, and that is because when you create a, anything with a satin stitch, the recommended length of a satin stitch is no more than 7 millimeters. The reason for that is it's an item that's going to be laundered. Let's envision uh, maybe a sweatshirt with a company logo on the left chest um, at a stitch longer than 7 millimeters, maybe 8 millimeters. That's a very long stitch length. If that item is to be laundered, it could snag with something and unravel the embroidery. Now, in some cases, users have had to create a longer stitch and don't want the auto split. In order to get rid of the auto split, just turn it off. Notice that those needle penetrations along the inside of that particular object are gone. Those will only be generated in the stitch length is longer than 7 millimeters. So in this area, it's detected it to be a long stitch, and it drops the stitches. I'm going to come back to the auto spacing and how to change density in a design after we talk about the tatami stitch. Let me just get rid of a couple of things here. Um, we'll make, make this a larger object and change the tatami. Okay, so that's a fill stitch. We call it katami. It's, it's used for large areas. Anything where a satin stitch is not going to give an area sufficient coverage, that's where you, you would use the tatami or a fill stitch. The large letters on a jacket back would require a fill stitch. Um, possibly different logos where areas are larger, you know, possibly like about an inch, you would put in a fill stitch. So any large area where a satin stitch is too long is when you're going to use a fill stitch. Now, it is going to increase your stitch count of your design, but if you want to keep the quality embroidery, you are going to have to every once in a while 
change of stitches, and then get to Tommy. With the to 10 stitch, the spacing, and I'm going to come out of true view so you can see this. The spacing is what control, controls the density of the spacing. This spacing is the needle penetration between each of the running stitches that create the tatami. The length is the length of the stitch. So think of this length is the same as the length in a running stitch. Because remember what I said at the beginning of class. The tiny stitches are just, they're just basically running stitches butted up close to one another. So that's the length of the stitch. The minimum length is the shortest length that a tatami stitch is going to generate. So it would not make, it would not make a stitch length shorter than four tenths of a millimeter. The offsets are the offset from one running stitch to the next, and this creates the different variations of fill stitches that we see out there. So if you take a look at this in true view, it's we kind of zoom it out. That's our one to one. It's pretty flat, possibly a little boring, very traditional. -less. Um, but if I want to change the look of that, I can change the look of this by just changing these values. So you can just kind of play with these, see how things are changing, it's a different look. See this almost looks with this equal value, one and one. It almost looks like the um, satin stitches butted up close to one another. So a really good way of, you know, taking one of the basic stitch types, the tatami, and creating a different look to add some creativity to that flat looking fill stitch. A partition line will also create different looks. Just play for putting in different values and that um, angles of the stitches. Let me go back to the offset fraction and our software defaults to 0.25 by 0.25. Now sometimes to reduce the stitch count of the fill area, I have seen in designs where the length of the stitch might be bumped up to say 0.4.5. If you look at the bottom left hand corner of my screen, it's got over a thousand stitches, but if I change this to 4.5, it has dropped it down to a little bit over a thousand. So 4.5, that stitch length is still short enough that it's going to give you a good quality um, tatami stitch. Okay, so now we're going to talk about controlling the density, and that is the spacing or the auto spacing depending on the stitch type. So I am going to set this at a one-to-one. -one. I'm going to duplicate this image, and one is going to be a satin, and the other one is going to be a tatami. I'm going to do this with letters. a little bit bigger. All right. So maybe we sell this off. The stitches are too tight. We need to back off on the amount of stitches in our lettering. Best way to do that with our software, and I always recommend using auto spacing because it does truly give you a very good stitch quality when using satin stitches because it does adjust the distance between needle penetrations based on the length of the stitch. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit on this. 
let's say that this particular design, I need less stitches. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bump this number up. I'm going to set it at 120 so that you can all see it. And I'm going to press Enter, and if you notice, you can already start seeing gap, it, gap on the outer edge. So the higher the number, the less, the less stitches in an object. It could be lettering. It could be a traditional, um, just an object, a circle in a design. The higher the number, the less stitches generated. If we need a very, very tight text, we can drop this down to, say, about 80. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, OK, well, what's, what's the correct value? As we all know, embroidery is not black and white. There's a lot of gray areas. A lot of, a lot of it is also how do we perceive that. I have seen Wilcom users set their text at 80%. Possibly because they like a very, very tight set letter. Other people set it at 100%. Don't be afraid to go ahead and play with these values and when time permits, just sew your stuff off and kind of take a look at what you like and don't like and jot things down and save your files so you can always go back to a reference, especially if you're just learning embroidery in our software. So again, the higher the number, the less stitches, see how it's opened up, the lower the number, the tighter the stitch, and therefore more stitches are generated. In some cases, one would need to turn off the auto spacing and possibly use the spacing. Um, a perfect example of this is puff embroidery. That top stitching over the foam is extremely tight to cause the perforation of the foam. So what this does is, at this point, my will come because I turned off the auto spacing. Between needle penetration, there's three tenths of a millimeter. So it's extremely tight. If I need it tighter, I could set it at point 0.2. So now I have two tenths of a millimeter between each needle penetration. extremely tight. If I set this to 1, it opens it up. So the spacing is the distance between the needle penetration. And this would be an equal amount between each penetration, regardless if it's a wide area or a narrow area. So if you ever need to actually have it set at a specific spacing, then you need to turn the auto spacing on and set your value. But for most things, my recommendation is to use the auto spacing. So auto spacing and spacing control the density of a set and object. Your running stitches do not have density. The only thing you control with them is the run stitch, the stitch length. In a tatami, in a tatami um, filled area, it's the spacing that, again, controls the density. It defaults to four tenths of a millimeter between the penetrations along the outer edge. If I needed to um, open it up, and I'm going a little drastic so you guys can see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and put in 1.0 and then press Enter. And you'll notice that between each needle penetration on the outside edge, it would be one millimeter. So the spacing is what controls your density. We're going to move along to um, pull compensation. And pull compensation is found in the pull comp tab of object properties. And it does default to on. Now, what pull compensation does is it lengthens the stitch. So it lengthens it in the direction that it's sewing. So for all of you to be able to see this, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my outline. And I'm going to go ahead and then on these letters. And what you're going to see, if you see the black line, this is the outermost edge of that particular letter or the object. If you notice, the stitch extends 
to the outside. If I went ahead and I measured this, it would measure this particular distance, your measurement. Let me go ahead and bump this up a little bit. You see now the letters come much fatter. What the pull compensation does is it compensates for the pull. The pull is caused by the pull of the fabric and it also stitches pull in the direction that they sew, in essence making them shorter than what they really are. So in my text, these stitches are sewing. In this left to right direction is the direction that they sew, and therefore, when we put it on the machine, they're going to shrink. The pull compensation entered compensates for that. Recommended to always have pull compensation on. Do you need as much as I'm showing here, 0.5? Again, it's going to depend on the fabric. If you have a very stretchy fabric that's going to pull a lot, you're going to need more pull compensation. Um, but at least start with our default of 1.7. What you need to watch with the pull compensation, let me go ahead and make these lowercase. And let me bring them down to about a quarter of an inch. And let me set my pull compensation to 0.6. Okay. A lot of pull compensation for small letters. So what happens? They're all starting to butt up against one another. The O has closed up. So in some cases, too much pull compensation is not a good thing, and you have to watch, especially with text, these open areas, your A's, your E's, your O's, anything with a hole in it. If you put too much pull compensation and these stitches start um, closing up, your letters, your A's aren't going to look like A's. Your O's aren't going to look like O's. It's just going to look like really like blobs on your, on your product. Um, general rule of thumb is anything that has an opening, you want about a millimeter. Now, the way to measure in the Wilcom software is M for measure on your keyboard will allow you to measure using two points the distance between two needle penetrations. Now, unfortunately, I can't visualize 0 0.04 hundredths of an inch. So when I measure these tight little areas, I like to set my um, measurement unit to metric. Now, if I measure from here to here, I am over that one millimeter. Just for example purposes, I'm going to bump this up to 1.0. Now, I don't even have to measure them. I can tell that there's less than a millimeter. This would tell me, and I use this as an, an example, that the pull compensation that I've entered into this object would be too much because that hole is completely closed up. So your pull compensation is used to compensate for the pull for the pull of the fabric and the shrinkage of the stitches in the direction that they sew. And pull compensation can be added to any stitch type except the running stitch. Oops, I lost my object properties. Hold on one second. I think they're automatic in our software. Um, so if you look at this particular object, it has no underlay. So because it is a large fill, I'm going to go ahead and select it at tatami. And then what you see is you see the tatami underneath that going in the same direction. Notice that the angle of the underlay cannot be changed. That's because of the input method that I use to create the shape. 
if you look down at the bottom of your screen where it says object one input A, this particular object was created with input A, which means that I plotted points back and forth to create a shape. Each of those points, the pairs of points, create the stitch angle that it turns a shape. Now I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And I'm going to use complex fill to create a large shape of tatami stitches. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on my underlay. And you look at this particular shape. And we move through the through the design. If you notice, my under now is going in the opposite direction. So if you create an object with input A and you fill it in with tatami and you're not seeing your tatami underlay go in the opposite direction, it's because of the input method that you use. When I use a complex fill, the tatami underlay is going to generate in the opposite direction of my top stitches. Underlays also have some properties. The Tatami underlay has a spacing of 3.0 because you need it to be, you know, you need each running stitch to be a little bit further from the other. And then the length of the stitch is 4.0. Some of these other features down here I haven't really um, gone into because they're a little bit more advanced. And this is just really basic stitch properties and how you control you know, your densities, your stitch counts, um, things of that nature. I could, with my underlay, select a zigzag. I could also have a second underlay, maybe an edge run. These margins that we see after the first and the second underlay, are the distance from the distance of the underlay from my outer um, from my outline. So in this particular shape, my first underlay, the tatami, is going to be two tenths of a millimeter. In this black outline, so you can see it here. If I select this and I move this value up. You could see how this running, how the tatami or the zigzag, the zigzag, I apologize, has moved further away from the edge of my object. Now, if I come back to my top, oops, let's do, sorry, I don't mean to get anybody dizzy out there. Um, now, the underlay in this particular shape with the top, I have more than I can choose from. So, if you don't see a particular underlay, um, it may be because that underlay is not available for the object type that you have selected. So with stitches, I can select from the center run. And what that does is it runs right down the center of the letter. It also has a length property. Again, the same as the running stitch length, the distance between the needle penetration. A zigzag, but these letters are a little bit too small for zigzag. As I change and go through the underlays, you see a change on my screen. Now everything, anything that you create with embroidery, you definitely want to put underlay. Again, you're going to say, well, what underlay should I put on my text? I'm sewing on a, a fleece. Again, embroidery is very, um, there's a lot of variables. I, would, I guess the best way to explain this to you is the larger the area, the more underlay, the smaller the area, the less underlay. But always put underlay on your objects because just like you wouldn't build a house with no foundation, you wouldn't build embroidery without underlay. So think of your underlay as the foundation of your home. Um, 
So we're going to talk about connectors now. Connectors generate between objects and letters. So as a technical support person, um, a lot of people always call in saying, you know, I created some text and it's not trimming between the letters, which is what I have on my screen. So how do we force trims between our text or our embroidery objects as we digitize? And the will come software that's controlled through the connectors tab. And I'm going to open this up so we can take a good look at what are they're doing in relation to this particular object. So right now, I've got my text will come on here. And I'm looking at trim after. And let's just say we change it to always. And someone's going to call me and say, OK, I've got it set at always, but my text is not trimming. So I'll take a look at the connectors at the time. Notice it says after object. And it's got this little down here. And then there's another type, inside object. Whenever you're working with our lettering tool, you want to make sure when you are trying to generate your trims that it's always set at inside object. So if I set this, if I change it to inside object, my text is selected. The type of connector, so what is a connector? It's what happens between between the letters. So the type is set at jump, meaning it's going to jump between the letter and not run. A run is an actual running stitch between the letters. So you would actually see it run from one letter to the next and see a running stitch between those letters. So we're going to select it at jump. Right now my trim is set at, at, at off. My recommendation with trims for text is to set it if the next connector is greater than our default is 2 millimeters. What happens is when the system looks ahead from the W to the I, if it sees a distance greater than whatever you have set here, it's going to trim. So a lot of you are probably saying, well, how do I get it to trim between the bottom of the I and the dot? In this case, what you want to do is you want to lower this number. So let's go 1.5 and press Enter. And there's still no trim. And I may need to go to 1.0. And at 1.0, it's trimming. Now, it might have been 1 and a quarter. Nope, only 1.0. So again, connectors strip the trim. When set at inside objects, between each of the letters in a string of text. An after object would be what it does at the end of an object. In this particular case, the Wilcom text is an object. So at the end of Wilcom, when it's done sewing, it's going to go ahead and trim. And it's going to set it back to two. So as we move along on connectors, so that's how you can that's how you control trims between letters and objects. I'm going to go ahead and digitize a couple things here. If I'm in true view, I see no connectors except the dot in between the C and the L, so everything is trimming. I'm also seeing triangles where those trims are taking place. So if I came back over to connectors, inside object, and I set it off, triangles are gone, and now there's a stitch connecting between the letters. Now as I scroll down, we have tie-ins. A tie-in is something that is sewn at the beginning of a letter or an object. So it starts sewing this W, and you're going to watch a little small movement here. See how my crosshair is doing little short stitches? That's my tie-in. 
with the tie-in is it locks in that stitch. It's going to grab your bobbin thread and lock the stitches in to the fabric. You want tie-ins after a trim or a color change because it's going to trim and start moving to the next area. You want it to lock in. Or if the previous connector is greater than two millimeters, which would be where those trims are. Tie-offs occur at the end in this case, before a trim or a color change. Now, you can set it to always tie off, to never tie off. I'm not recommended. You think they're going to start unraveling if you set it at off. Um, I always recommend just using the will come to false if you're ever in doubt. So you definitely want to tie off before a trim and a color change. And you always want it to tie off the last. So right now, my tech doesn't have trim, so I'm going to turn the trim back on, and if I sew through this, I'm going to zoom into the very end of the end, because that's where that tie-off is going to occur. So here it's finishing up my zigzag stitch, and then see how it's going back and forth, and it's tying it off to lock it down before it trims so that it does not unravel. You can also see this at the bottom of your screen in the prompt line. When you move through your, through your um, design using your arrow keys, it's going to tell you if there is a function. It could be a color change. In this case, it's a tie off and a trim. So again, a lot of people will call in saying, I have no tie-off, my stuff is unraveling in my hut. Remember that when you're dealing with trims in your lettering objects, you must have your connector set in inside object. After object is what happens to these objects, these embroidered objects. So right now, after an object is jumping, and it's trimming if it sees a distance greater than 2 millimeters. It changes to a run stitch. Actually, I'm going to grab the, the change it to a run stitch. And if you see, there's running stitches connecting my objects. See what you can hear? Remember, this is an object. So at the end of this object, going to the next one, because I have it set here at 1, it's going to create a running stitch. So if you see this, you want to go back to jump. And you can tell that it's a jump because the line is actually a perforated line as opposed to a solid line. Now, if between these objects, I didn't want trims. I'm going to set this to on, and you notice that it is connecting with the jump, but it's going to pull the thread. So you would possibly have to um, trim that with some scissors. So remember, connectors is what generates trims between your letters and between any object in a design. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, um, we've covered the basic stitch types. We've gone over basically basic object properties, how to control density, how to control your running stitch length, what is pull compensation, underlay, and then the connectors. Basic information. You can play along with, um, or you can play with the software and those values to see what you guys each come up with because what I like might not necessarily be what you like, because everybody perceives everything differently. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute um, the attendees, and we'll spend about um, another you know, 10 or 15 minutes if you have any questions, or if I went through fast through something or I fumbled through it, um, you know, please ask me, because I want you to get something out of today's class. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you.
Oh. And if there are any questions, now would be the time to ask. Actually, what I might just do is I might go down through the list of my attendees. Chuck, I see that you joined us today. Do you have any questions on anything that we covered? That's Chuck Williams. Okay. Um, anybody else out there? Any any questions? Don't be shy. Nobody's got any questions? All right, well, if there are no questions, I'm going to end the class. I do hope that all of you um, have learned at least something from this class. I do just you know, recommend playing, playing around with the software, playing with the different properties, seeing, um, you know, seeing what, what you guys can come up with in terms of your embroidery with some of the basic information that we've covered today. The class has been recorded. Um, once the recording is available, we will send it out to, um, to those of you that attended. And then, of course, anybody that didn't make class will get that out to them also. So again, I thank you very much for attending today's class. I wish all of you a wonderful um, remainder of your day. And I hope to see you in my next class. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.